News of the Times Murderous Mondays The Ilford Tragedy It is 1923. Married older woman Edith Thompson and younger 19-year-old Freddie Bywater have been carrying on an illicit affair for quite some time, punctuated with nearly daily long letters from Edith musing out loud on how she could kill her husband. Then, on a dark October night, her husband, Percy Thompson, is murdered by knife as the pair are walking home from a night out. Lying in a pool of blood, the investigation is on to find out who killed Percy Thompson. We hope you enjoy the show. About Edith Thompson, nee Edith Graydon. Edith Graydon, 1893 to 1923, was raised in East London in Manor Park and was the eldest of five children. Edith was described as very intelligent and ambitious. High positions for women were limited in London in 1923. Once she had completed her education, she took on a role within London Milner's Carlton and Pryor, where through her hard work and quick intelligence, she was promoted to the position of chief buyer to the company. Edith Graydon married Percy Thompson in January 1916 in Ilford. Edith made more money than her husband and more money than her father. She contributed more than half of the cost of the couple's new home in Ilford. In 1923, the deeds to the house legally were required to be in Percy's name. Edith was not a shy and retiring girl. Instead of settling down to wedded bliss, Edith, with her above-average wages, looked to evening entertainment with dances, theatre, cinemas and restaurants. She was a woman somewhat out of step with the restrictions of women her same age at the time. She also took on a lover, eight years her junior. Frederick Freddie Bywater, 1902-1923 Frederick had attended class with one of Edith's younger brothers, so he knew the Graydon family through Edith's brother. When Eddie was 13, he joined the Merchant Navy. Freddie was invited to come along to a weekend holiday on the Isle of Wight with Edith, husband Percy and sister Avis in 1921. It is during this holiday that the then 27-year-old Edith and 19-year-old Freddie began the illicit affair between them. Freddie moved into their family home in Isleworth as a boarder while he was on the land. The move helped to fuel the romance. Percy was abusive to Edith on occasion, and it was reported that he had thrown Edith across the room, leaving her very badly bruised. It was during this incident that a confrontation between Freddy and Percy led to Freddy moving out. The fight between them was most likely regarding money. By all accounts, Percy had no idea that anything nefarious was occurring between his wife, Edith, and young Freddy, most likely because he was aware that Edith had known Freddy since he was a child and had watched him grow up. The lovers continued to communicate by letter upon Freddy's departure, with occasional illicit meetings taking place when possible. Edith poured out her soul in the letters without any hindrance. The letters which played a prominent role in the trial showed a woman who verged between reality and the plots of films and plays that she attended. It is in these letters that the first words of murder are thrown out. One of her many letters states, I was buoyed up with the hope 
of the light bulb, and I used a lot, big pieces, too not powdered, and it had no effect. I quite expected to be able to send you that cable, but no, nothing has happened from it. The letter was in reference to having ground up a light bulb placed in Percy's meal to kill him. The Crime Having been to a show in Piccadilly Circus, Percy and Edith had taken the train back and were walking on their way home when Percy was viciously attacked with a knife. In a matter of minutes, he was dead in a pool of blood on the pavement. Edith remained unharmed. There was no theft. It was the 3rd of October, 1922. From the Exeter and Plymouth Gazette, the 5th of October, 1922. Percy Thompson, 33, shipbroker's clerk, was yesterday found dead in Belgrave Road, Ilford, with wounds on the head, throat and arm. The police believe he was murdered. Throughout the afternoon, Chief Superintendent Wensley and the Ilford police were busy investigating the affair. A number of drains in Belgravia were cleared by council employees under the supervision of the police, in order, if possible, to find the weapon with which the deed was believed to have been committed. One account says deceased and his wife were returning home arm in arm after spending the evening at a London theatre when Mr Thompson called out and fell to the ground a hundred yards from his house. The investigation. Percy's brother pointed the police towards Freddy. There they found some of the stack of letters from Edith, and Edith quickly became a second suspect in the murder investigation of her husband, Percy Thompson. From the Exeter and Plymouth Gazette, the 7th of October, 1922. Ilford murder charge. At Stratford, London, yesterday, Edith Thompson, 27, and Frederick Bywater, 20, ship's steward, were jointly charged with the murder of the woman's husband, Percy Thompson, shipping clerk at Ilford. A police witness said Mrs. Thompson stated that when walking together with her husband, he called out, Oh! and fell against her. They had been quite happy together the accused were remanded. As the investigation takes place, including the reading of the hundreds of letters from Edith to Freddy, statements from all parties are taken. Freddy is quoted as having said, I love her, in reference to Edith. I only meant to injure him. The evidence of physical abuse is brought forward. From the Pall Mall Gazette, 25th of October, 1922. Mrs. Thompson, in tense scene, weeps bitterly as her father tells the story, Mrs. Bywater in the box, sons return home on night of crime. The father, pale and struggling with emotion in the witness box, a witness called by the prosecution. His daughter, a tragic-looking figure weeping bitterly in the dock as he unfolds his story. This tense scene was enacted at Stratford Police Court today when the hearing of the murder charge against Mrs. Thompson and Frederick Bywater was resumed. Bruised wife flung across the room and a large crowd of people assembled outside Stratford Police Court this morning in the hope of gaining admission. Interest in the case has been maintained from the day when the crime was committed and increased in the reading of the sensational letters in court yesterday. My husband did it. Bruises on Mrs. Thompson's arm. Bywaters used to call Mrs. Thompson Edith as she called him Freddy. Referring to the Tuesday following bank holiday last year, witness said that Mrs. Thompson showed him her arm, 
which was black from the shoulder to the elbow. The witness asked how she had done it, and Mrs. Thompson replied, My husband did it last night. High words. The witness added that after Bywaters left, Mr. and Mrs. Thompson had a few words with each other every evening. The high words usually took place in the bedroom at night time and sometimes were over cash. With the found Edith letters recounting her wish for her husband to die, amusing on the subjects of poisoned and crushed light bulbs placed in food, a decision is made to have Percy's body exhumed for testing. Nothing suspicious or incriminating is found. The Trial The environment of post-war Britain did little to help Edith at that time. Edith did not fit the norm for a woman of her social standing. Attractive, and with enough money to do the social outings many others post-war peoples dreamed of, she also had a handsome husband and now had taken a lover when many women had lost husbands and partners. With all these riches, she was perceived in the press and in the public eye as a selfish and uppity woman who had seduced young, infatuated Freddy and led him astray. Edith was vilified. Attractive, older Edith and younger, dashing Freddy became the murderous, glamorous couple of the time, with Edith's letters splashed across the newspapers. Crowds of people attempted to watch the proceedings at the Old Bailey. Homeless and unemployed waited in the queues throughout the night and then sold their places in the queue to attend the court proceedings for more than a week's wages. Eyewitnesses' reports did state that Edith had been taken by surprise by the attack on her husband. Tests on Percy's body found no evidence of crushed glass or any sign of poison. Edith took to the stand to protest her innocence, but was quickly destroyed by the prosecution through the use of her many letters. Edith so disliked by all, was made to look even worse upon taking the stand. From the trial papers, Exhibit 12, envelope to Mr. F. Bywaters, 11 Westo Street, Upper Norwood, postmarked Ilford 815, Saturday 20th of August 21. Come and see me Monday lunchtime, please, darling. He suspects. Letter dated the 31st of October, 1921. Oh, darling, I do want to thank you so much. Heaps and heaps for everything. You're much too good for me, darling. In that way, really, you are. At any rate, I'll be able to think of you every morning and every evening because I'll be able always to wear silk now. And the beads, no darlingest boy, I can't say thank you enough. Everybody wants me to leave them to them in my will. I feel proud, ever so proud, when anybody admires anything you have given me. The lilac set I like best of all. I told you this before, but I must tell you again, they are for Thursday. Thursday the 3rd of November 1921 first and then only for the first and last time I am with you. I don't think you can possibly know how much I thank you, but I don't mind if you don't know because I know how much. Darlingest boy, I got your note this morning. If you felt it was awful on Saturday and wanted to die, how do you think I felt? It's indescribable, all the pain that this deceit and pettiness causes. Yesterday I thought was too awful to bear. I don't know how I got through the day, my mind and thoughts I had to make frozen. 
I don't think, not about anything. I should have run away. I know I should. I felt quite sure. Saturday at 5.30, it was terrible. Every time I see you, the parting is worse. On Saturday, it was awful. So bad, I couldn't stand it any longer. I had to cry all the way to 41. I keep asking myself, will it ever be any different? Things seem to be so hopeless. Do they to you? Darlingest, nothing that you say like that can ever make me feel more miserable than I do. Just try and think, darling, that I always feels as badly about things as you do, perhaps worse. Circumstances always have to be considered and remembered. Will you think this always, darling? Perhaps it will help. I am going to see you tonight, aren't I? Just for that very little while. It's the only minutes of the day that is worth living. When you shook hands on Saturday, I felt sick with pain. That was all you and I could do. Just imagine shaking hands when we are all and everything and each other to each other. Two halves not yet united. The reading of the letters out loud gave the courtroom and the spectators a view of what appeared to be an unhappy married older woman ensnaring a young impressionable man. Letter from Edith to Freddy, Exhibit 62 Last night I lay awake all night thinking of you and of everything connected with you and me. Darling, I think you got into Marseille's last night, didn't you? Anyway, I felt you did. Perhaps you got my first letter, the other ones you will get today. All I can think about last night was the compact we made. Shall we have to carry it through? Don't let us, darling. I'd like to live and be happy, and not for a little while, but for all the while you still love me. Death seemed horrible last night when you think about it, darling. It does seem a horrible thing to die when you have never been happy, really happy, for one little minute. I'll be feeling awfully miserable tonight, darling. I know you will be too, because you're only been gone one week out of eight, and even after seven more have gone, I can't look forward, can you? Will you ever be able to teach me to swim and play tennis and everything else we thought of and the sands in Cornwall? You remember that wonderful holiday we were just going to have in 22 and that little flat in Chelsea you were coming home to every time and that tumble-down nook you were going to buy for me one day. They all seem myths now. Yesterday I met a woman who had lost three husbands in eleven years, and not through the war. Two were drowned, and one committed suicide, and some people I know can't lose one. The letters were read out loud in court, creating a sufficient sense of dread to Edith, with all eyes on her, judging her. The letters listed here are only a very small sample of the abundance of correspondence from Edith to Freddy. Further testimony is given as well from the neighbour who knew all parties quite well. He states how he felt sorry for Edith, who came across as a very vibrant young woman. He had difficulty warming to her husband, Percy, for no defined reason. Freddy Bywaters he disliked immediately and could see that the affair would obviously take place as he described how an unhappy woman will gravitate to a dashing young man. Summing up. The judge in his summing up verbalised the general feeling of distaste for Edith Referring to Edith's adultery, he said, 
I am certain that you, like any other right-minded person, will be filled with disgust at such a notion. Upon the conclusion of the trial, the jury left the room and came back after two hours with a verdict of guilty. Edith, by now in a pitiable state, nearly unable to walk, was half carried back to the courtroom to hear the verdict. She and Freddy were to be executed. Bywater throughout maintained that Edith knew nothing whatsoever about the intended stabbing. He never wavered on this point. Bywater's plea, letter by Freddie Bywater says to the Home Secretary, 3rd of January 1923. I'm asking to ask you to use your power to avert a great catastrophe and also to rectify a grave injustice. Edith Thompson and I have been found guilty and today stand condemned upon a charge of which we are innocent. In the first instance, I wish to speak to you of Edith Thompson. The case for the prosecution was based entirely upon a series of extracts from letters written by her to me. There were mention in these letters names of some poisons and broken glass to her husband. I am asking you to believe me, sir, because what I say is the truth, that Mrs. Thompson never had any intention or the slightest inclination to poison her husband, or to kill him in any other way. The only way to treat those letters is the way in which I read them. She is hysterical, and she's a highly strung woman, and when writing letters to me, she did not study sentences and phrases before transferring them to paper. But, as different thoughts, no matter what, momentarily flashed through her mind, so they were committed to paper. Sometimes even I could not understand her. I am, sir, yours respectfully, Frederick E. F. Bywaters. Reprieve. Over a million signatures were collected to spare the life of Freddie Bywaters. Edith received minimal support. Every woman in the past decade facing the death penalty had been spared, not for Edith Thompson. The dislike of her remained intense throughout. There was no reprieve for either of them. From the Northampton Chronicle and Echo, the 12th of December, 1922. The Ilford Murder the trial of Frederick Bywaters and Edith Thompson for the murder of the latter's husband at Ilford has been closely followed by millions of people during the past week. And now that both prisoners have been found guilty and sentenced to death, it will continue to fill people's minds till those who exercise the prerogative of mercy have decided whether or not the sentence should be carried out. There is no room for doubt that Bywaters murdered Thompson, and the plea that it was justifiable homicide. In other words, that the man was killed in self-defence was entirely unsupported by evidence. All the evidence shows that it was a deliberate murder committed by the lover of the wife. The only possible element of doubt is as to whether Mrs. Thompson was partly responsible for the crime. In her amazing letters to Bywaters, there were apparent incitements to murder. Were these the deliberate promptings of a sane woman, or, as the counsel for the defence argued, the wild outpourings of a victim of hysteria? Did she know that murder was to be attempted on the night that Bywaters stabbed her husband to death. As to both questions, Sir H. Curtis Bennett said everything that could be said for the prisoner, but the jury were unconvinced. 
and the judge eventually agreed with the jury. Juries are always most reluctant to return a verdict of murder against a woman. It is a long time since the capital sentence was executed against a woman. There is sure to be an agitation for her reprieve. Everything that can be said for that will be pressed on the Home Secretary, and the case may, of course, be taken to the Court of Criminal Appeal. All who are opposed to capital punishment will be opposed to the execution of either of the prisoners. Others will feel that though it may be permissible to hang a man, it is barbarous to hang a woman. Still others say that the woman is not guilty. Public opinion on these matters has tremendously changed since it was thought to be a menace to the social order if a boy or girl went unhanged for a paltry theft. Except for Mrs. Thompson's letters, there was nothing to lift this case out of the ruck of murder charges. A married woman and her lover, a festering desire to get the husband out of the way, then murder. The story has been told in various ways and in all ages. Always it thrills and excites, and the effect on people's minds is enormously widespread and deepened in these days by the verbatim reports of the trial fair-flung from day to day by the newspapers. The Execution, 9th of January, 1923. Edith Thompson and Frederick Bywaters were executed separately for the brutal stabbing of Edith's husband, Percy Thompson. Prior to the execution, Edith had been regularly injected with powerful sedatives, making her somewhat delirious. On the day of the execution, Edith's legs and arms were bound and she was carried to the gallows. How much she was aware of what was happening to her is questionable. With the opening of the trapdoor, she is dead immediately. Writer of the time Edgar Wallace wrote, As the prolific novelist and screenwriter Edgar Wallace put it, if ever in the history of this country a woman was hanged by the sheer prejudice of the uninformed public, and without the slightest modicum of evidence to justify the hanging, that woman was Edith Thompson. The Aftermath Historically, the case has been described in the UK as dubious and as one of the worst miscarriages of justice in British history. Edith's torrid love affair with Bywaters, a scene through the lens of her steady stream of love letters, to buy waters helped to lead to the conviction of the violent stabbing of her husband. The judge, Mr. Justice Sherman, was strongly criticised after the trial for his strong bias for the prosecution and for openly questioning the honesty of a defence witness. Bywaters always insisted that Edith was not involved and had no prior knowledge of the attack. What do you think? Guilty as charged, or an innocent miscarriage of justice? That concludes this episode of Murderous Mondays, The Ilford Tragedy. We really hope you enjoyed the show. If you did enjoy the show, please subscribe. Our goal is 1,000 subscribers. And with the fantastic support of our wonderful News of the Times community, we are making great progress towards that goal. We upload six days a week. Fridays are a new limited series called Forgotten Fridays, where we explore a snapshot from newspaper articles, advertisements and publications of a time from long ago. Saturdays are Serial Killer Saturdays, where we do an in-depth look at a serial killer from our extensive database. The time span of these ranges from as early as the mid-16th century 
to this 21st century and encompasses men, women, children and couples who kill. Sundays are eccentrics as we do an in-depth look at some of the quirky, unusual, notable and bizarre characters from Great Britain, which offers up a rich supply to choose from. Mondays are murderous, where we investigate in-depth a historical murder. Tuesdays are twisted and usually involve a collection of stories based around a theme, such as stories of matricide or when employers go bad. Wednesdays are wicked in this new series that will explore outrageous organisations, bloody locations and shocking events with a bit of murder and mayhem sprinkled in. From all of us at News of the Times, thank you again for watching or listening. This has been News at the Times, and I am Robin Coles.